Welcome to Bama Bug Fest on the Web, a virtual event dedicated to the fascinating world of insects. Bama Bug Fest on the Web is a collaborative event brought to you by UA Museums, the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum, the Alabama Museum of Natural History, the Department of Research and Collections at the University of Alabama, UA's R Rogers Library, and the Tuscaloosa Public Library. We are offering nine total days of bug-themed content ending on July 25th. And for a full schedule of events and everything that you can watch uh, and what we're doing, you can check out BamaBugFest.org, and that will uh, tell you everything you need to know about what we're doing here with Bama Bug Fest on the web. Well, my name is Rebecca Johnson, and I'm the UA Museum's Communication Specialist, and joining me uh, this afternoon is Dr. John Friel, who's the Director of Alabama Museum of Natural History. And uh, John, what are we going to be talking about today? So today's theme is uh, bugs that bite and sting. So we, if you've been following us this morning, well, actually, I guess the first, our, our 10 a.m. was kind of more musical. It didn't really deal with that. But uh, the previous program we had had dealt with the Black Widow uh, comic book character and Black Widows in general. So I'm going to continue on that theme. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, arthropods or bugs that potentially are dangerous. Um, you know, generally I, I'm very positive, bug positive. I uh, want to tell you all the great things that bugs do, but there are a really small number of arthropods which potentially can cause harm to you. Um, so the idea is I want to just kind of discuss today, if you're outside, walk in your backyard, things you might encounter that if you are unfortunate enough to pick them up or maybe step on them accidentally, might bite or sting you. So there are hopefully a few of these things you already know about, some you may not. Um, just kind of raise awareness of the, kind of the small percentage of arthropods that, you know, are, are any, uh, I guess, medical concern potentially uh, to humans. And uh, just as a reminder before jo uh, Dr. Friel gets started, uh, this is live. So if you have any questions about any of the things that uh, any of the uh, stings and biting things in your backyard uh, that Dr. Friel talks about, feel free to drop them in the comment section and we will get to them. All right. Uh, you want to go ahead and get started? Sure. Let me switch over to my presentation. All um, right. So again, if you caught any of my earlier presentations, I gave one just introducing the Bama Bug Fest. The second one had to do about arthropod diversity. So you may have seen this particular pie chart before, but again, to put it in context that there are well over um, a million described arthropod species of what we call generally bugs in the broad sense, but only a really small proportion of these are likely to sting or bite you. So in that pie chart below, everything from the, the purple lavender slice diptera going clockwise over to other arthropods, the kind of um, greens with the spider in it, those are the, the bulk of what I'm gonna be talking about today. And they make up over 80% of animal species. So they're incredibly diverse, uh, but considering how diverse they are, only a really small fraction of them present any danger to those. And the other thing I wanted to just mention, um, I'm gonna be talking more about the animals Again, while I am a doctor, I'm not a medical doctor and I'm not gonna be giving any kind of medical advice. So if you ever are bitten or stung by, or suspect you were bitten or stung by an insect or a spider or some other arthropod um, and feel you need medical attention, do not hesitate to contact a medical provider um, for proper um, treatment. Um, most of these things are not life-threatening, but again, uh, there are some rare situations, particularly if you have pre-existing allergies to some insect venoms where you can go into anaphylactic shock and can it can be deadly if you don't get proper medical attention. So just want to put that disclaimer in there. Um, I may point you to some websites that have additional information about um, diseases and health issues related to um, these bugs, but I'm not going to give you detailed medical advice. And if you ever need it, go directly to a medical professional. So the other thing I want to point out again is that um, a lot of people think bugs are scary. So, but I want to remind you that the vast majority of bugs, even though they look scary, are completely harmless. So I just picked three examples of bugs I thought that if you ask the average person, if you showed them a picture of this and asked them, is this something you'd be afraid to be bitten or stung by? They would probably say, definitely, that looks really scary. So at the top there is a giant ichneumonid wasp that has an incredibly long ovipositor or stinger that actually it's cut off there it would actually extend probably almost all the way across my slide if you, the entire picture was there. In the middle is a male giant stag beetle. Uh, this is actually the same species and uh, it's featured on the logo for the Bama Bug Fest. It's a locally occurring uh, stag beetle we have here with these impressive mandibles. And at the bottom is an adult male Dobson fly. This is what uh, Helgramite turns into. If you saw our, our Helgramite segment or the, or the comic book and TV character Helgramite, 
this is what the actual Helgramite animal turns into. And again, the males have these impressive jaws. But all of these things uh, are completely harmless. Um, the big wasp, it actually, that uses that long stinger-like ovipositor is to put its eggs inside in trees to feed upon other wasps. Um, the big males here, they use those big jaws for competition with other males or for breeding for holding females, but they're completely harmless. So these big scary bugs, completely harmless. And that's true for the vast majority of bugs you're likely to see. So I'll show you ones that could potentially harm you, but just because something's scary doesn't mean that it, it necessarily is something you have to worry about, worry about getting bit or stung by. So going back to this pie chart, I'm going to kind of go through it the way it's shown here. I'm going to start with the diptera, that purple slice, and you may see the silhouette of mosquito. Uh, diptera are broadly, more broadly known to, as flies, and mosquitoes are in fact just one group of flies. So I'm going to start there, and I'm going to work clockwise around this pie chart with the different groups, giving you some local examples here in Alabama of representatives of those arthropod groups, which could potentially bite or sting you. So number one is mosquitoes. Um, I think I don't have to explain to anyone what a mosquito is. Um, mosquitoes are everywhere this time of year in Alabama. If your yard is like mine, you've got mosquitoes. And there are a lot of native mosquitoes. There's actually an entire book. I pulled out here, UA Press um, actually has a book. I don't know if you, Rebecca, can you cut to my screen a second? I've, I've actually got a little silhouette there and I'm actually holding up the book if you can't see it. But um, if you're really interested in mosquitoes, you can get the whole book that's got information on in the biology because there are some actually very beautiful mosquitoes uh, and they vary a lot in their morphology, what they feed upon. The most notorious one is an introduced one, these Asian tiger mosquito. That's actually the one I have shown on my screen. And this is the one that uh, is a real pest. And uh, this species as well as some other mosquitoes carry a number of diseases. So most mosquitoes, if they bite you, the worst they're going to do is maybe give you an itchy bite. And this is in fact uh, due to your body reacting with a little bit of the saliva that they stick into you when they feed. Um, these are the females that are getting a blood meal. Uh, so they attach you they, and they, when they're drawing your blood out, a little bit of their saliva gets into your body. Your body thinks that that's uh, correctly, that it's something foreign and has an immune response. So you get that little itchy welt. That's what typically happens with the vast majority of mosquitoes. But in Alabama and other parts of the U.S., occasionally we have outbreaks of other diseases. If you go to that Alabama Public Health website, you can actually see some numbers uh, that will show you over different years one particular uh, disease. I think right now there's some, a few cases of some of the different types of uh, encephalitis that are spread and West Nile virus as well that are spread by mosquitoes. But it's not uh, peaking this year yet. And there have been cases a couple of years ago, some of you may have heard of Zika virus, and occasionally there are outbreaks of other things. Uh, one that's not on here that is spread by mosquitoes, which is actually one of the most serious diseases worldwide is malaria. And uh, it's rare, but occasionally we do get outbreaks of malaria again in the US. People travel uh, from areas which do have active malaria populations and can sometimes bring it back here. But for the most part, it's been controlled in the US for some time. So mosquitoes are by far the most common one you're gonna get uh, encounter with. Um, I think probably everyone gets mosquito bites in the summer. I do. I know if I step outside for five minutes, I often uh, get one or more mosquito bites. And there's various ways to control them. If people have questions, maybe at the end I can talk about uh, some ways you might deal with uh, reducing the possibility of you interacting with mosquitoes while you're outdoors. Other flies uh, that are particularly um, nuisance flies are horse flies and deer flies to batted flies. These are another group which uh, bite as well. These ones, unlike the mosquitoes, when they bite you, you typically know it. Um, they're, some of them are quite large. Some of the larger horse flies are probably almost close to an inch and a half, two inches long. And uh, when they bite you, they have a big proboscis they stick in you and you feel it's like a big needle going into you. So uh, while they are very painful, um, they unfortunately here, and I'm not sure there's any diseases that are spread by our native uh, to batted flies. Although in other parts of the world, for example, if you ever travel to Africa, I've done this in the past, uh, you've heard of maybe heard of tsetse flies. They carry something called a sleeping sickness and transmit that. So a lot of the biting um, arthropods I'll talk about today, most of them themselves, their bites are not going to cause you issues. But uh, through the through millions of years of evolution, they have co-evolved with parasites. 
and often they serve as the vector or the vehicle for transmitting uh, some kind of disease. It may be a virus, it may be a bacteria, it may be a protozoan or, protozoan or something else that they can transmit through their bite. Um, so that's a kind of a recurring theme we'll see for some of these biting arthropods. And I find that horse flies and deer flies in general are just more annoyances. I often sometimes running, they'll buzz around your head. They uh, kind of, and often you can, I, I can usually feel them for, they land on me before they can bite me. I can usually swat them off. But I know, you know we've had, for example, our museum expedition sometimes we're in areas where the deer flies in particular are really thick and they're just a con more of a constant annoyance. And every once in a while, you don't swat one off and they'll bite you when you realize it with a kind of a sharp bite. Next up, uh, moving, uh, we've talked a little bit about diptera. There are some other biting uh, flies as well, things like um, midges, noceums are also flies. But let's move on to uh, butterflies and, and moths, Lepidoptera. So as in general, adult moths and butterflies are, present no harm to people. Um, they generally are completely harmless. Many of them don't even have functional mouth parts. The ones that do just have a long tongue or proboscis, and the worst they could do is, is tickle you. But there are, locally here, um, as larvae, some um, species we need to be concerned about. So we have things that are known as stinging caterpillars. And I've got a few examples here. Uh, I've got also a URL to a website you can check out that's um, by Auburn Extension um, that has links, a little bit about some of the species. And I've just have a few here. There are families of moths that are called slug caterpillars. Uh, almost all of them are venomous. Also, um, some of the silk moths that we have flannel moths, and some of the tussock moths. And I just have a few examples here. And there's so many, I, I can't go through all the examples, but I'll give you some general rules about caterpillars. If you see a caterpillar that looks fuzzy, um, the big one I have shown there in the bottom is something that's called a pus caterpillar. It's the uh, larva or caterpillar of a southern flannel moth um, that looks like a, a kind of a toupee. Uh, maybe if you've seen Star Trek, I, I always think of the tribbles from Star Trek when I see one of those. Um, but those hairs, if you actually brushed against that, they break off their barb and they're associated with venom uh, and they will cause a very intense uh, rash uh, at the contact site. So some of them are spiny, some are hairy, some are boldly colored, but not all of them. So I, in general, I tell people, if it looks like that, don't touch it. There are exceptions, um, but if you want to play it safe, if you see a caterpillar that is fuzzy or spiny looking, Look, but don't touch. It, it, you, you don't want to be sorry. We don't have any here that are um, deadly. There are some which, I think there are some in other parts of the world that people have actually had such strong reactions to some of these that they, but ours are just mostly painful. And it, often the way people encounter these is they're trimming bushes, uh, maybe picking up leaves or brush across a, a brush, and there'll be one of these caterpillars on them. It's seldom, and occasionally people pick them up by the mistake, but usually it's just the occasional encounter of, not knowing one's on a leaf and brushing against it. Uh, so again, uh, it's only the caterpillars you need to work, worry about, not none of the adults. So again, um, there's something here, and I, I, I've actually, I think I've only seen one of these species in the wild, the little saddled uh, green uh, caterpillar we had one a few years ago that someone brought in. But uh, they're out there this time of year, it's peak caterpillar season, so definitely, and I've seen actually, I've, I've seen tussock moss, I should say, uh, this summer as well in my local parks. So moving on to that, the next big group is Coleoptera. And although this is, by some argue, some will argue, the largest group of arthropods, it's not one we typically have to worry about bites or stings. Uh, there's not only actually one species I know of, of a beetle, and it's not in the US that actually can sting. It actually has scorpion-like stingers on its antennae. But there are beetles here that can exude some chemicals if you pick them up, but in general, they're not gonna bite you or sting you. So I'm not gonna talk about any of those today. Uh, you, know, you might get pinched if you picked up a big stag, stag beetle, it might pinch you with its jaws, but you're not gonna get a venomous bite from it. So the next group we're gonna talk about is probably the most important one and probably the one that uh, causes the most concern uh, globally when it comes to insect stings, and that's the Hymenoptera. So these are uh, things like bees, hornets, wasps, and velvet ants. I've got pictures of just a few common ones here are European honeybee, uh, paper wasp, yellow jackets, and velvet ants. And what these all have in common is they, the females at least, have a stinger, uh, the non-reproductive female. So the queen doesn't, but, um, and, and the top right shows you that. So the posterior end of it, there's a little pointy bit that 
uh, normally, uh, and most other insects is used for depositing eggs, but it's been uh, evolved in this group to serve for defense. So these animals have that barb, they can stick into you and it's associated, it's almost a hy hypodermic needle that can inject a venom into you. And depending on the species, things like honeybees, they sting you and the stinger stays in you and they will fly off leaving the stinger and actually the venom organs continuing to pump venom into you. Things, most other wasps can sting you multiple times. And then in the case of velvet ants, so that little cute little fuzzy thing on the lower right hand corner is a species of velvet ant we get in here in Alabama. And these tend to be boldly colored. They're actually just wingless wasps, or at least the, the females, uh, they have wings, but they very quickly drop them off and will look like just a fuzzy looking ant running around. You'll see these in the middle of the day. I saw one last week uh, while walking my dog and they look quite cute. They move very quickly, uh, but these are in fact wasps. And just like the other wasps, they can sting you. And these animals, as I mentioned, actually have venom. So you will have um, a reaction to their venom. It's usually quite mild, but there is usually a short period, sometimes only a few minutes, you may get some swelling at the site where it goes in there. They vary a little bit in the toxicity, which I'll talk about a little bit. But in general, for most of us, a bee sting is gonna be an unpleasant event. It's gonna be maybe stepping on attack or something like that. Um, it's not gonna be life-threatening. The one exception is that some people develop after being stung by bees or wasps one time, their bodies develop hypersensitivity. And it's those individuals which any future interactions with um, wasps or bees or, or fire ants, as I'll talk about in a minute, can also produce life-threatening. So the, the problem is some people, once they've been stung, their body overcompensates. So the next time they get stung, their body reacts so strongly, it's way beyond just the site where they've got stung and they will get constriction of their uh, trachea, had be difficult to breathe. These are people that need to be carrying EpiPen. So if you have, you know, if the first time you get stung by a bee, you have a really bad reaction, you're probably a candidate and should seek medical attention because you potentially, well, that first time wasn't serious, next time could be. So this is a case where I'm gonna tell you if you have any concerns, definitely reach out to your doctor uh, and be checked to see whether you have these sensitivities because it's a case where uh, it starts off not being threatening, but if you get repeated uh, stings, not everyone develops it. There are people, uh, people, beekeepers and others that are outdoors get stung multiple times and never develop the sensitivity. So it's not all people, but it is a percentage of uh, people out there that are stung by bees that will develop some kind of uh, serious allergy that they need to be concerned about. The other group, which um, besides um, wasp bees and are the ants. Those are, these are also hymenoptera and they're also hymenoptera we encounter here all over in the Southeast. Um, I know I have multiple fire ant nests in my yard. I'm always battling with them, trying to re remove them. Um, they are a presence throughout much of the Southeastern US and Southern US. And these, much like the wasps, although you don't think about it, when you've, most all of us have probably had an encounter where we've accidentally stepped on a mound. Um, we get a swarm of these coming out they, while they do bite you, what you're actually feeling is their sting. Much like the wasp, they have a little stinger at the other end. And there are documented cases of both people and animals being killed by fire ants. It's incredibly rare, um, but if you were to accidentally fall on a man, you could very quickly be covered by hundreds, if not thousands of ants. So some of these colonies are, co colonies are quite large. A couple of, of stings here and there is not gonna hurt you. But again, some people develop sensitivities to you. So again, for me, it's more of an annoyance. These ones, uh, you often, after you get stung, they'll leave a small pustule, which will develop a day or two later. Um, that's how I usually often sometimes know if I'm walking outside and forget, you know, I'm not wearing shoes or something like that. I'll notice a few days later, I've got a little pimple on my foot. It's probably a fire ant sting that I didn't notice while I was out in my backyard. So again, it's something to be really uh, cognizant of because they're everywhere. And typically, you know, you can easily avoid them if you just look out for their mounds. Uh, they typically, you have to disturb them. You typically, if you come across a mound, there may be one or two ants coming in and out. It's when you accidentally bump them with your lawnmower or a small child steps in one of these, that's when you could get serious issues um, with fire ants. But again, uh, just something to be aware of. And I think most of us just learn to live with them. Um, you can commercially buy um, pellets you can put on there. You basically have to kill the queens to destroy the colony. But um, 
you know, it's, it's a temporary solution. You, they will, you'll never permanently remove them from your yard. They're constantly moving around and you'll get them once again. They're, they're here with us to stay. And the ones we have are introduced. Uh, they're not the native um, fire ants. So, uh, and we've got at least, I think, two, possibly three species here in the States now. Um, the other thing I want to point out there, um, particularly about Hymenoptera, there was an entomologist, um, Eric, uh, excuse me, Justin Schmidt, who developed a pain scale. So people often ask, well, how does that hurt? And I like to analog uh, make this analogous to uh, people that like to eat hot peppers. You know, there's some people which a little mild pepper is really too p spicy for them or a ghost pepper is, is too much and somewhere in between. It varies a little bit. So for everyone, your pain threshold might be really different. But uh, he systematically classified where these kind of stings were. So you can kind of get a sense for uh, where some of these are. And he just did it for Hymenoptera. So we've got a mixture of bees, wasps, hornets, and ants here. Uh, the fire ants tend to be in the left-hand side. There's a couple of different fire ant species. Um, th the size of the circle is like how painful it is, how long it lasts. The, um, so the bigger circles, the pain lasts longer. Uh, the color actually has more to do with the intensity of the pain. So most things we're talking about are like on the five-minute pain. You'll, for five minutes, you'll have an annoying pain, maybe a little bit longer. At the other end, uh, I mentioned the velvet ant there. Uh, 30 minutes. Velvet ants, I forgot to mention earlier, a local name, a lot of people call them here in Alabama in the southeast, are cow killers. Again, they're not more powerful enough to, cow to kill cows, but I think someone who got stung by, stung by one embellished that, realizing how painful they were, and gave them that name. Some of the paper wasps we have here, um, and then we have things, we don't have bullet ants here in Alabama. That's a tropical uh, ant that has a very painful sting, but just to give you an idea that there are different thresholds and different individuals will respond differently. Um, I equate a lot of things. I've been stung by a lot of bees, wasps, and a few other things. And for me, it's like a five minute annoyance um, and then it goes away. Uh, so hopefully for the vast majority of people, that's the same way unless of course, you know, you're an individual that uh, develops um, allergies and has to worry about subsequent case of anaphylactic shock. So that's it about Hymenoptera. The remainder I'm gonna talk about the other insects. So there are a lot of other insects that do bite. I'm not going to talk today about fleas, lice, bed bugs. These are all things which are important, but they're not things you typically encounter in your backyard. So I want to talk a little bit about water bugs. Um, so if you had caught my talk about uh, bugs in general, true bugs, the, the hymenopter, are very distinctive in having piercing mouth parts. So the two water bugs I want to bring up here are two things. If you have water in your backyard, maybe a pond, and you go in it, particularly if you wait about in the weeds, um, you may encounter these creatures. These are some of the, or two examples of large kind of aquatic arthropods that they're big predators and they do can, they can pack a punch. They both have piercing mouth parts. Uh, the one on the left is a giant water bug. These get quite large, some of them uh, three, four inches larger. Uh, they have kind of large raptorial front legs. And on the right is something that a lot of people call locally a water scorpion. Uh, they have this tube-like extension on their back. That's not the stinger. Uh, that's actually the breathing tube that they respire through. Uh, they have a little piercing mouth part that's folded underneath them. And just like the giant water bug, they can use that piercing mouth part, which they normally use on aquatic prey, other aquatic insects, fish, tadpoles. Uh, but if you pick one up and handle it, as some people sometimes do, I've, I've I'm going to uh, collect fishes and nets, and sometimes you'll, you get these and you're picking through to get the fish, you may encounter one of these animals. And uh, I like one of the common names I like for the giant water bug, they call them toe biters. Uh, I guess potentially something in kind of the little meme I have there at the bottom it makes a little fun about that. Maybe uh, one of these big water bugs, uh, one ask you to uh, share your pinky toe. So again, these things are not particularly common. You may see them occasionally outside the water. Um, they do, at least the giant water bugs do fly, and I have seen those sometimes attracted to lights at night. So these are just two other examples of things that bite. Uh, they don't really have any venom you have to worry about, but they have big, much like the uh, horse flies, they just have these big mouth parts. So when they do bite, they're just sticking a big old needle in you. Um, so that's what you're feeling. There really isn't any toxins you have to worry about. And then the remaining pie slice there are all the other arthropods. So we've gone through all the major insects you're likely to encounter in your backyard that might bite, sting you. So the remainder I'm going to talk about are non-insect arthropods. And of course, the most common one uh, that's come up here are spiders. And I've mentioned this before when I talked about um, arthropod diversity, and I'll mention it again. 
the only real spiders of medical concern in Alabama are brown recluse spiders and black widow spiders, of which there's a couple of species. And they're generally not very aggressive. Uh, the brown widow spiders, uh, current households, most people that have them don't even know they have them. Um, they have this brown color. They have kind of a darker violin shape, uh, dark patch on their cephalothorax, that anterior segment that all the legs attach to. Um, in general, they're kind of very secretive as their name suggests, but if you are bitten, uh, they can produce local swelling, a little bit of uh, tissue death and necrosis at the site. Again, they're not life-threatening unless you have, you know, might maybe have some other underlying health issues. And then there's black widow spiders. We've talked a little bit about them. These are also very common spiders. These often hide in, in under crevices. I get them in, I have a retaining wall and the little between the bricks, I sometimes get them living there. And these are black shiny spiders underneath of the females have this orange as adults, orange to hourglass. Um, these ones that they bite you, they can uh, produce some other symptoms, cramping, um, uh, nausea, sweats, things like that. Again, um, you're unlikely to, to die from them, uh, but they, they may cause medical concerns. So if you ever get bitten by a spider, spider bites are incredibly rare. Um, most things that are claimed to be spider bites are not in fact spider bites. They're other um, arthropods or insects. And then sometimes they're not even that. They're sometimes you get um, a little staph infection and people misidentify that as being a spider bite. So in most cases, you have to see the spider and know that you've either picked it up or accidentally rolled on it. They're only going to bite you in a defense. They're not going to bite you in an aggressive posture. So uh, that's my little thing. My, you know, we, I love Spider-Man and little joke down there is Spider-Man asking, how's your bite going? Did you get any superpowers yet? So uh, most spiders, you're never going to be have to worry about them like uh, Peter Parker did with his radioactive spider. Other arthropods, uh, this one for me actually is the one venomous arthropod I encounter very frequently. Um, for whatever reason, where I live in Tuscaloosa, I get this particular species. This is the Southern Devil Scorpion. We have two or uh, three species of scorpion. This is the most common one that's found throughout the state. I find these all throughout my house. Um, I saw one last night. I was taking out my garbage can and was had my little flashlight, and there was one I saw walking out to the street to put my garbage can out. Incredibly common. Um, I've been stung by these. Um, it's like a bee sting, and they're super common. Um, but we have them, in, at least here in Alabama, all the species we have, it's like a bee sting. Uh, it's going to be nothing worse than that. There are species in other parts, particularly the southwestern U.S., there's one or two species um, that are, are quite painful. There are some other parts of the world, scorpions, which do have very painful stings that uh, there are deaths reported with. So again, locally, don't worry about them. They really are much scarier than they look. Uh, my little meme down there is uh, scorpions are kind of nature's little nightmare experiment. Uh, you, let's combine a lobster referring to the kind of um, claw-like appendages they have, spiders, the eight legs, and then wasps with their sting on that that tail appendage that you see there, their telson. So they look scary, um, but the ones we have locally here, they're no worse than a bee sting. So don't be concerned about them. And like I said, I've learned to live with them. I, I When I find them, I, I don't squash them. I've actually trained my wife to come get me. I pick them up and release them because they, they're eating other things. Um, I see them eating other other pests, um, and they get eaten by other things. I, I find scorpions in spider webs. I've seen them in black widow webs in my yard. So it's, it's a doggy dog world out there. And again, this theme has come up repeatedly. A lot of these animals um, are eating other things, which can also be injurious to us. So they all play a role uh, in the big picture. Another one that I personally hate, this is probably my least favorite um, arthropod or chiggers. And a lot of people don't know what chiggers are. Often, if you see chiggers, you probably have an image like that of your arm or leg, maybe around your waist, of uh, these red itchy spots. And this is something um, I always dread. I usually get them early in the season, the first time I'm out and about, uh, particularly when uh, grasses get high and you have to walk through tall grass. I know probably the next day or two, I'm going to get some of these red welts uh, anywhere with this constriction uh, a clothing, often around kind of your underwear and your waistband, something like that. And what these are, they're just larval mites, um, picker larval mites that um, crawl up you. They're almost microscopic. You typically can't see them with a the naked eye and they feed on you for a few days and they drop off. But most people have um, an allergic reaction like this. So they're just irritating. And um, 
I think once you've had triggers, you kind of never forget it. And, and sometimes you get one or two, sometimes you'll see really bad cases where people just, they're, can be incredibly uncomfortable, particularly if you get them in your lower back. I know if you have to go to work in the office or have to sit for any long period of time, often they wear your clothing rubs against them can be painful. So again, these are not life-threatening, not venomous, uh, don't carry any diseases, but just are incredibly itchy, much like mosquito bites. And the little meme down there is a joke because I really, I think I knew about triggers. I've lived both in the Southeastern and in other parts of the U.S., but I think really in the Southeast, um, if you spend any time out, outdoors, you you learn about chiggers, and it's kind of a, a real annoyance. So I think that meme really uh, connects with people that live in the southeast. The one group of uh, non-insect arthropods, which are, is also kind of a real pain, are ticks. And this is one much like mosquitoes. Um, we need to be concerned of not only because they bite us, but because they carry many diseases. So um, I've got, again, a, a website there uh, from Alabama Public Health Department that you can get more information that's specific to Alabama, as well as uh, links to where you can go for more information. Uh, we have several species of ticks in the state, uh, the most common ones being the black-legged tick, a lone star tick, and dog ticks. And I think there's maybe one more tick that's expanding its range. I'm not sure it's in Alabama yet. That's a foreign Asian tick that has been introduced in the U.S. And these are, again, of our annoyance. Um, Again, I get ticks every year. Um, I've been bitten by ticks almost every year as an adult. I've never contracted any of these diseases. I've been quite lucky, but that's always the possibility. And there are um, certain areas of the U.S. where, depending where you are, local populations of ticks, uh, they will have outbreaks. So there are places in some, in some years where Lyme disease will be particularly pr prominent in some areas. So it's always really good to be concerned about these. And if you do have a tick bite, to monitor it because these diseases often will have, you know, if you know you've been bitten by a tick and you suddenly start getting fevers or you start getting a red a ring around the bite site, those are issues that you need to talk to a medical professional to be tested. There are tests where they can pinpoint the exact diseases and what the appropriate treatment would be. Um, but mostly they're annoyances. Most time you just kind of, you know, you're, you're in the shower or bath or something and you like feel something. It's like, what is that on me? Because when they bite you, you typically don't feel it. You can kind of might feel them crawling on you before they, they bite to you. And then they actually cement themselves to your skin. So that's why they're so hard to pull off. And some of them embed a little bit. But in general, the bite itself doesn't irritate you unless you kind of knock them or something or it gets a secondary infection. Um, so most of the problem with ticks is they're kind of gross and disgusting. You might find this blood engorged tick attached to you. Sometimes they rupture and you'll see all this blood that comes out of the, actually, the, it's your blood that's gone passed through the tick, but in general, the tick itself is not doing a lot of damage to you. It's, it's more, if there's something while it's feeding on you that comes into you, one of these diseases like um, Lyme disease. So that's the one reason we're really concerned about them. Um, tick populations go up every year. Um, we're only one of the hosts for ticks. A lot of times there's another, sometimes it's deer mice, um, sometimes it's other animals before they get on us. And we're just kind of one meal in the process. Uh, they really are not there. They just want to get a blood meal and get off of us. They vary. Sometimes you make it at one tick. Sometimes you get a dozen on you. Uh, they vary from year to year, but it's something people should be aware about and recognize um, if you're going to be outdoors. I'm, uh, um, they're typically, I tell people, ticks, if you actually watch their biology, it's fascinating. They often will climb to the very tip of a blade of grass or a piece of vegetation, and they'll just wait with their legs out for days at a time until something comes along and just brushes against it gently and they will latch to that and crawl up on you. So they just have incredible patience waiting for a particular um, animal to come by so they can get that blood meal. So they're gross to some. The more I've learned about ticks, I've really been fascinated by their biology because uh, they really are amazing um, at what they do because they do a good job of it. And they, we have so many of them here in the state. So you being grossed out by them, I kind of find ticks kind of cool as things go. One other group. Um, so this, these are other. These are arthropods. They're not arachnids. Uh, these are the centipedes. So you might remember we had a lot of discussion earlier about millipedes versus centipedes. Millipedes, you're not going to get bitten by them. Um, they do exude some chemicals. They're not going to sting you. Centipedes are kind of different because they're all predatory. They have a means to subdue prey. Uh, so I've got here. This is one of the larger centipedes. This animal life. Is one outside my house. I get these inside my house as well. They get about three or four inches long, move quite quickly. If you, It's hard to see. So there's a dorsal view on the left. On the right is an, um, a ventral view. We can see a little better. But at the front of them, 
behind the first kind of antennae uh, are these long jaw-like structures that have these, these tips. Those are a pair of legs that are modified and they have venom glands. So much like spider fangs, they can bite and pierce you. And again, it's a painful bite. Um, there and, and other places, ours, while they're painful, aren't gonna hurt you, uh, but you should be aware of them. So I generally say, if you see a centipede, um, don't try to pick it up. Um, they are, they, they're super fast and you'd be hard pressed to pick one up before it would turn around and try to bite you. Again, the bite is not gonna, other than being a painful, is not going to be life-threatening, but it, it is a group we should be aware of because uh, I get them in my house, not as common as scorp uh, excuse me, scorpions, but I do get them regularly. I often find them and, and resuscitate them. Often they they desiccate and they you'll sometimes them see curled up like on the right because they've dried out. And if you rehydrate them, you can sometimes release them. And again, if I find them, I release them from my home. So that's all I'm going to say about the more common things you might encounter in your backyard. Again, I want to remind people. Um, we're kind of in the middle of our Bama Bug Fest. We have an opportunity here if you want to share some of your bug-themed artwork, some memes, I love memes, jokes, photos you've taken on your, your social media channels. Just um, tag them with Bama Bug Fest and do that before the 25th of this month. You'll have an opportunity. I'm going to go through the different social media channels and pick my favorites, and I'm going to give away uh, one of these stickers. We have a, a Bama Bug design, which features – a male giant stag beetle by Thomas Shahan, uh, the artist that designed this. And then some of you that have been watching our programming have seen some uh, programs involving Dr. Sebastian Echeverry, a spider biologist. He's uh, designed and makes available these Black Lives Matter jumping spider stickers. So I've got a few of these to give away. So I love to see our engagement with the public. Uh, however, however you want to do it with your social media, just tag it. And if I like what you did, uh, there's a good chance I'll send you uh, one or both of these stickers while we have supplies. And I just want to put a uh, shout out to one of our uh, listeners, or actually viewers, um, is someone um, drawn, drawn another fish on Twitter. Um, this is a small five-year-old boy in Ireland. I know him outside of this because he draws fish, and I've been following on social media. And through that, he realized I was at a museum in Bama Bug Fest and is now taking an interest in arthropods. And he's been following our programming. I don't know if he's doing it in real time, but I wanted to put a shout out. Uh, he, he goes by E. So E out there in Ireland, I really want to say thank you for all your artwork, how engaged you are. Uh, he, not only does he draw things, sometimes he does little cutouts and does makes little videos of the interactions of these creatures. So um, I'm impressed by just not only uh, the impact we have, but how this is a kid Across, over, you know, we're in, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. This kid, I'm not sure what city he's in in Ireland, uh, has been connected with us. So I love that aspect of Bama Bug Fest, particularly the vir virtual aspect of it. Um, it'll probably be connections we've made globally that we never would have made just by having a, still a great event here locally in Tuscaloosa. So with that, Rebecca, um, I will happily take any questions people have about any of the uh, biting and stinging arthropods I've talked about or anything else that we've talked about thus far at Bug Fest. So I have so many questions. Right. Um, wow. So, uh, uh, so I think you initially said something about how if um, I can't remember exactly which one you were talking about, uh, the the ones that are furry, not to touch them. Yes. Uh, could 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 you reiterate that for me? Because I I know myself. If something is furry, I, I'm going to immediately. Yeah. Uh, want to be because i because i enjoy the the insects that we've seen like it, jumping spiders have you yeah. know some some of those spiders have a little bit of fur and so it kind of makes them look cute and deceptive so i want to make sure that i understand that so which which ones are, are the ones to kind of stay away from yeah let me, let me pull up the slide again very quickly so uh, it's it's not exhaustive but i just pulled out um a few that i, I quickly had some images of where we go here let's see there we go okay let me switch on the slide. So let me go to slideshow. So I just know myself. I, I need to make sure that see, I understand. I don't know if you can show myself. I need to go back and come in so you can see that. Let me just okay. that and yeah. share it. Is that a general rule for a lot of these insects that if if they uh, look cute, <laughs> if there's yeah. some, some furry nest to them? Some of them are boldly colored. And in general, it's not just insects, but a lot of animals that can bite or sting are sometimes brightly colored as a warning to predators. I'm mean, not so much to us. They're it's kind of often to bird predators or other insect predators. Same with the black widow. That black hourglass is a warning to other organisms that hey. Um, 
I have a weapon and I'm, I'm not afraid to use it. So um, same is true. So there are some boldly colored, um, but in general, the way they deliver their venom is they're not doing it with stingers or with jaws. They do it through these little hairs that are called urticating hairs. So the hairs themselves can break off and sometimes they're barbed, sometimes they're hollow. Um, so what happens is when you brush against them, it's some of these stick to you. And when they stick to you, they kind of deliver some of that venom. Some of them are sharp, at least the tips are sharp, will pierce the skin. So the general rule is if it's fuzzy looking, if it's spiny looking, don't touch it. Like I said, there are exceptions. So there are things that if I showed you, you would say for sure that's venomous. But like I said, you don't want to find out the wrong way. So in general, unless you're, you're really certain what you're picking, it's almost like it's true of like snakes. I mean, it's a lot of people mistake venomous snakes for non-venomous ones. So I always tell people, um, well, the probability is it's not a venomous snake unless you're hundred percent certain, don't pick it up. You can look and don't touch. So my recommendation is if it's fuzzy or spiny looking, um, just take a picture of it, post it to iNaturalist, and then you will learn that way. Someone will say, sure enough, you, that was a pus caterpillar. Good thing you didn't pick it up. Or, you know, you know, that's a woolly bear caterpillar. That's actually one that looks like it might be dangerous, but it's completely harmless. Uh, and there are things which sometimes mimic other ones. So that's that's the way things work in biology. There are things which really are dangerous, and there are some things that learn, hey, if I look like something dangerous, I will also gain that protection without having mm. really to spend anything on producing venom or things to deliver venom. I guess I'm safe in a way because I'm, I'm not uh... – I like the the fuzziness of some of these images, but I'm not going to be inclined to try to pick them up. So I guess maybe that'll that'll keep me uh, safe from any. And like dangerous. I said, most people's encounters <laughs> is accidentally they brush against them. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you you reach up to pull a, a leaf off, and you don't realize on the backside of the leaf is one of these that's you know feeding. Now most of these caterpillars caterpillars are just feeding machines. They're out there um, doing their best lives to make it to a pupa. Uh, so they can become that adult moth or butterfly to reproduce. So all they care about is eating. So they just want to be left alone. And, um, you know, it's like, but if you go out right now, I guarantee if you know where to look for caterpillars, I often look for leaves. Um, and if you start, if you see leaves that look like something's eating on them, look for, they might not, they might not be on top of leaf, look under leaf and you might find some of these caterpillars. Um, it's like that, that one on the bottom, right. I saw three or four of those in like a 30 minute walk last week with my son. Uh, they were on tree trunks and they're just out there looking for food, maybe looking for a place to pupate. Um, so it's it's prime caterpillar season this time of year in Alabama. So most caterpillars are harmless, but there are a few out there that, you know, you can look at them, just don't touch them. Yeah, I recently ran across some gypsy moths. Uh, a neighbor's house uh, was yeah, I don't was have having some trouble some with those. Some of the cat caterpillars, um, they actually can exude some chemicals that are also irritating. So we get... Um, some tent cat. I don't think gypsy moths are one of them, but they're things that produce similar web tents um, that I was reading about uh, will exude chemicals when they pupate. So it's actually not the caterpillar, it's the pupa that if you touch them, you can, some people react to it. Hmm. Yeah, the, those moths were definitely chomping on that tree. The, the, well, <laughs> that, the tree leaves were, yeah. uh, were I mean, separate. If you actually see how much cat, I mean, I think it was actually Megan Pimsler mentioned in her talk, you know, the way she finds caterpillars is you look for leaves that are being eaten and then sometimes you, you actually look for caterpillar poop because oh, these yeah. things literally as quick as they're chewing up leaves, they're passing it through. So it's, it's like, it's like being around a horse or a cow. It's just going in one end, coming out the other constantly. And, you know, you can look down and sometimes you literally find piles of caterpillar poop and then you look up and sure enough between that's where they are. Yeah, we've had some really great guests on these Bamba Bug Fest on the web live streams, but I have to say that uh, daily wrap up we did where they talked about uh, insect poop uh, was probably one of my you, favorites. You, you <laughs> it probably, was. It that's was where good. you learned what frass was. You know? Yes, yes, really learned about frass. Well, I'll just pick entomologist shoes. It's like, oh, it's caterpillar frass. Yeah, that was probably one of my favorites. Um, so yeah, that that was great. Um, I did have a question about you mentioned the uh, were they velvet ants? Mm -hmm. Are they called velvet ants because they the it looks like velvet? What what? what yeah, is, that's what exactly is... why they are. They all of them are are fuzzy like that. So again, they're they're fuzzy, but they don't sting with the hairs like the caterpillars. But they do have that fuzzy appearance. Um, a lot of them. Some of them are red, so some of them come in black and red velvet. So that may be the other reason. I just, you know, I don't know who exactly coined the term velvet ant, but that's what they're known by their common name. Um, and like I said, they are just wingless wasps, 
and you usually see them because they because they're so defensive they're just out in the open and they move really fast so when i see them it's usually i see something red out of the corner of my eye moving in the grass and i'm like i bet that's a velvet ant and but I'll, I'll see them in the middle of the road i mean they're kind of like something that you know i'm a cow killer i just love that dave you know <laughs> nothing's gonna mess with me and that's pretty much true so they they're just incredibly bold you know most ants are kind of um maybe don't want to be necessarily drawing attention to themselves but the, these um velvet ants they, they just like don't care it's just like and, and i think most animals realize there's something that isn't worth messing with because um they were on that schmidt pain index they were on the the far side they weren't a bullet ant but they were in that area much more so than a lot of other of their uh, ant friends like fire ants yeah, I'm going to have to look out for those uh, velvet ants now because I have been bitten by a fire ant and I understand what you were talking about you with were, the... Uh, you you the, were stung? Well, you do get bit, but what you feel is the sting. Oh, I was stung. <laughs> so that's the proper way to say that. So yeah, so I was stung by a fire ant once and it was pretty gnarly. It was pretty gross. I had a, yeah. I, I don't know what the official way to say that, but it looked like a, like you're, a you're, pus you're ball. Yeah, that's yeah. What it is. yeah, you're actually okay. right. They, they, they really have this charism um, characteristic uh, characteristic um, pustule that forms. Okay. And I'm not sure what it is in their their venom that does that, but you know, you don't get that from a bee sting or a lot of other hymenopterous stings. But for fire ants, I think there's all kinds of, you know, all venoms aren't the same. Some of them have acids and other compounds in them, but that is like the char uh, the, the characteristic. And I remember like when I, I lived in Florida for a while. I, I grew up in New York, but the first time I encountered, I think I was a um, I was in middle school playing soccer and there was a fire ant mound on a soccer field and I was totally naive on what they were, you know, it was sitting on the ground and a little too close to a disturbed mound. And um, it's funny now, I have a three and a half foot year old son and it's taken a couple of encounters, but he now knows, he will point out fire ant mounds to me because he stepped on them a couple of times. He's had a couple of dozen fire ant stings, has got little pustules and that's how he learned. Um, yeah. And again, I, I'm so proud as a papa that's like, okay, he knows what those <laughs> are. He doesn't know they're fire ants, but he'll say, you know, no touch ants. And I'm just like, okay, you, you've you learned, you know, he, growing up in Alabama, he learned this at three. I was, I was had to be in middle school before I learned that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something you don't want to do again if you can help it. I, I got a little frustrated because uh, I was so, um, that was kind of my first fire ant bite that I, or sting, uh, that I had. Uh, and I went to the doctor, maybe a little more paranoid than maybe I should have. And uh, and I asked I asked him, you know, do you know what it is that, that uh, caused this? And he was like, well, you would have to bring in the insect to us. And I thought, well... How am I supposed to know what, what it was or be able to bring it in? Uh, but I think the reason that we determined it was a fire ant was because of that pustule. So that was a good way to determine that. You, you often have multiple of them. I mean, you usually get them on extremities. So I think the idea is, you know, I think once you've had it, you you, you recognize what they're in. Like I know, it's like, you know, it's going to happen. Next time you get stung, it's like, okay, I've got to wait. Because it, it, it doesn't happen immediately. It takes about 24 hours. And then... Sometimes I, I'm one of these people, I, I usually lance it just so it'll proceed quicker to, to recover. You don't have to, they will recover on their own. And if you get multiple ones of them, you know, particularly if you get them on your finger, sometimes you'll get them at a joint, it'll be a little bit irritating. But like I said, I've, I've gotten better um, about when I know where they are, I just kind of like, okay, I've got them on my yard. I know where the fire at mounds are, I'm gonna hit them, but I'm gonna be really cognizant of how quickly they come out because you know, the other thing is when it floods here too, um, Fire ants are amazing. They will form rafts. Um, people, if you Google fire ant rafts, you'll see in places that get flooding, uh, fire ants, their nests get flooded and they will leave the nest and they form these giant mats that will float on water surfaces. And while it's rare, there have been people that have been stung by floating mats of fire ants. You could be out in the water and there could be a mat floating down that you might actually come in contact with. And then um, they will span um, stretches. They're, it's, ants are really interesting, but fire ants um, are, are really fascinating in, insects as well. And while they're a nuisance, um, you know, they're something that are here to stay. And my, my favorite story about them is that um, the first or one of the first species of fire ants discovered in Alabama was discovered, discovered by young Dr. Edward Wilson, a UA alum, who is a well-known ant expert. You know, he was a young boy growing around Mobile area, and he actually got into ants early on. And realized that this was not a native species that actually had come in through shipping containers coming through the port of mobile so another kind of neat alabama 
related bug Baba story or Baba bug story for you. Yeah, those fire ant rafts are incredible. Uh, they, yeah, they really are. And, that uh, is wild. I've never seen yeah. one of those. Yep, and they could, they, and they very. There's some really neat social behaviors or group behaviors that ants do. How they self assemble. Um, I'm sure there's something that, like, I know you love comic books. I don't know if there's something, some maybe the ant can do with this in some future comic or movie. Um, yeah, that would be that would be really interesting to see. Um, and I guess uh, when uh, just to add to my little uh, fire ant story, I was told not to do anything to the pustule. Is that is that correct? Like yeah, you have I mean, to kind of let it go away on its own. Like everything else, um, when you have an injury to your skin, there's always the possibility of a secondary infection. Um, so people that are particularly prone to skin infections, that's probably true. Um, I. I probably shouldn't do it, but I do because I just find it more of an annoyance. It's like having a blister, you know, the same thing. Like if you develop a blister, you know, a new pair of shoes, they tell you, you know, you can leave it alone. But like me, if you're like most people, you just want to get it over with and, and just want to drain it. You know, you can do it with a surgical, ne you know, sterilized needle. Um, I, I generally just clean the site uh, carefully. Um, but you're probably right. I think, you know, the, the proper medical advice would just be to leave it alone. They do to itch a little bit sometimes. Yeah, so they like do. Like everything else, sometimes you'll itch them without realizing um, that you've had them. If, particularly if they're in a space where, you know, if they're on your back or something like that. I mean, people do get them on their buttocks if you sit on the ground. I mean, they're not always on things which you can actually easily <laughs> see. So uh, I haven't got, I mean, some, they will crawl. But I mean, you know, I'm just amazed how quickly they move. You know, if, you if you've never appreciated how, quickly hundreds of ants come out of an anthill um poke and from a safe distance poke a fire ant nest and see their response they are i mean again they're just protecting their homes they're that's yeah. all they're doing um they don't have they're not with the vengeance they just want you to, you know they're like someone come in your yard they're just like get out of my yard um, <laughs> but they do it in force yeah it looks like uh mary beth says ice helps with fire ant stinks that's a yeah. good tip and we did have a question about uh, grass wasps. Do you know anything about grass uh, wasps? Grass wasps or paper wasps? I'm not sure what grass wasps are. I'm not sure. I, I've encountered a red paper wasp and it- yeah, uh, They're the most common thing we have around here. They're various, we call them paper wasps because they build these very distinctive nests out of wood pulp that kind of looks like paper. Some of them are big, you know, sometimes these enormous paper nests. Others are relatively small. I get them under the railings on my porch um so and they, there's also some that um some wasps that build mud nests there's mud daubers um all those could potentially sting and often uh, some of them are very protective probably the worst thing is like yellow jackets those ones tend to be a little bit more aggressive uh sometimes they nest underground they will sometimes nest in places in your home or like eaves and other things like that so in general again these things they're just good parents they're protecting their young um it's all a defense mechanism um they really want nothing to do with you, but if you push comes to shove, they will stand their ground and it varies. Some are not very aggressive. Others are very aggressive. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what a grass, but I do probably the most common things I see are some of the red, like Polistes moths that are kind of paper moths that I see them in my yard in the grass all the time. Generally they fly away from me. Uh, I would have to probably step on one or try to pick it up to get stung. Um, if I was near their nests, I might get stung. I have had a few encounters with yellow jackets where I have accidentally bumped their nest and then much like the fire ants, they just like, it's like ringing their doorbell. They're like, they just come out in mass. And that's when you have a problem because they yeah. can overwhelm you. Yeah, Sherry says that uh, the one she encountered laid eggs in her wind chime tube. Yeah, that sounds like paper wasps. They, you know, they're, they try to find places that are sheltered from rain and things like that. So that's why I love getting on it. And sometimes you can see the nest, but often you can't. But a wind chime sounds like a really good place for a paper wasp to build its nest. And they're seasonal. So what happens at the end of the season is uh, um, sometimes the, the, the nest will fall out. You'll find the little paper. Uh, it usually has a few cells, wh which were used to be where they had their eggs and where they, their young were growing. And then they you know, will build a new one next year. Oh, yeah, the, uh, I, oh, I didn't see that comment yeah. there. Latin name. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, grass carrying wasp. Okay, that's what they mean. Oh, yeah, that's a really distinctive watch. Thanks for that. Just rung a bell with me. Yeah, these ones too. These ones actually, they their nest. They actually use pieces of grass, and they they like really narrow places. So I can imagine a wind chime. And sometimes you'll find like 
sometimes you find the nest where it's like, why is all this grass crammed in this little spot? And it's one of these, they go out and they collect, instead of the paper wasps collecting wood pulp, uh, these wasps collect um, little pieces of grass that dry out. So you literally get a little bundle of grass. And I remember the first time I saw one of these, I didn't know what it was, posted an iNaturalist, and someone identified it as one of these thread-waisted wasps that uh, have this very distinctive. So that's the cool thing I love about the stuff is you learn a lot. Sometimes you don't even have to see the insect. You can learn about what it is by something they've made. And I, I, I'm fascinated not only by the, bu the bugs themselves, but often the structures they make, whether they're out of other materials, made out of silk. Um, there's, it's kind of a detective story that I like uh, solving. Have you, uh, do you know anything about a, a hornet sting? Jennifer says uh, she's had several stings yeah. in her lifetime, but the hornet sting on her yeah, fingertip hornets, was by far the worst. Yeah, hornets, uh, again, these are relatively big wasps. Um, these ones tend to be quite painful. They're mo moving to the right side of that, that Schmidt pain scale. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised. I don't know if you've got any questions about the murder hornets. Uh, right before all COVID started, um, that was the big thing that was in the news. There was out in Washington state, uh, they had documented these giant Asian hornets uh, or had been reported. And this was like all over the news. It made CNN and there was a lot of fear about giant murder hornets. Someone gave it that name and that was what they, and again, those are type. We do have European hornets here. Um, there are, and again, they're, they're painful to get stung by. And sometimes you get stung by multiple ones and they tend to be a little more aggressive, but um Again, they're nothing that unless you have underlying allergies, if you've been stung by them and had a really bad reaction um, and are prone to potentially being uh, having anaphylactic shock for them, then they're a concern. But for most people, um, if you see a big hornet's nest, steer clear of it. Again, it's one of these things that if you see it, just avoid it. Um, you know, you just don't want to get too close to them because if you accidentally knock a nest, then you've got a real – I mean, I, I don't know. I, I remember the the Looney Tunes cartoons. You know, people always do Wiley Coyote with with hornet's nests and things like that, um, because a nest has often hundreds of individuals. And if you knock that nest at one time, you've got a hundred angry individuals that are going to come after you at one time. You know, and then you you've got a problem. Yeah, those Looney Tune uh, cartoons they got <laughs> up to all kinds of trouble <laughs> with things like that. Uh, so that's a, that's a good tip. Well, I guess we're we're almost at our time, Dr. Friel. Um, is there anything that you would like to leave our our viewers with in in terms of uh, what we talked about today? Yeah, again, again, curious. Um, you know, I, I want people to have positive interactions with bugs, um, but we do have all you know. And I, like I said, I've been stung. I've been bitten by all these things. Uh, it's never pleasant. Um, myself personally, it's never. It's always been a learning experience. You know, I've I've, I've learned from. I remember the first time I got stung by a scorpion was here in Tuscaloosa. I was moving one i move i often move them with my bare hands and this one time i got a little lackadaisical and got stung in the finger and it was a learning experience because now i know exactly what it feels like and again for me it was just uncomfortable um we always worry about we do a lot of outside field trips and we're always worried when we take kids out or adults out in the field um, we you know there are venomous snakes we have to worry about in alabama venomous insects and we've had camps where there, we've had participants that uh, no, we, they have, um, allergies to bee and wasp stings and we have to, they have to carry EpiPens and we have to be prepared and know what to do with them. So it's a serious issue, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a minor risk for most of us. Uh, so I don't think we have to respond in kind. Um, I think there's so much positive things that bugs do for us that that's what I really want to focus on. But this is a subject just, you know, to have a, an important conversation that there are things out there to be concerned about. You know, mosquito-borne diseases are a big problem. Um, they, some places they spray for mosquitoes. Um, there are other ways to control mosquitoes. You don't have to use poisons. I was hoping someone would ask about that. Um, so my parting advice for that would be for most mosquitoes, they need, well, they need water to reproduce. So remove standing water. If you have standing water that collects in things in your yard, just drain those. Um, they don't need a lot of water. They, a little cup of water is enough for mosquitoes to reproduce. So just be, remove that. And the other thing is there are non-chemical ways. You can buy these little, they call them mosquito dunks. They are these little tablets that are actually, they're a bacteria that only kills mosquito larvae. They're harmless to people. They're harmless to other aquatic insects. And you just have to throw those. So maybe you have a, you know, a, a pond in your backyard or you have a water garden and you don't want to drain it. You can buy these mosquito dunks and put them in there. They're available uh, locally. You can get them on Amazon and Walmart. 
and you just put those in there and this bacteria it will just kill the mosquito larvae and, and because of that you won't get adult mosquitoes and nothing else so that's my kind of recommended way and then you reduce the possibility of getting a mosquito bite and getting a, any mosquito-borne diseases if they're prevalent in your particular area that's good to know and i guess with with anything the more you know about something the yep. you know the less you're afraid of it or the less you're uh, uh not willing to you know address it so that's that's good to know all right. Well, I think that's uh, going to do it for us here today. Thank you for joining us for Bama Book Fest on the web. Content like this will always appear at 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 4 p.m. with a daily wrap-up that we're doing at 7 p.m. So if you had some uh, more questions that uh, you didn't get a chance to ask here at, uh, during this hour, uh, you can do it at the da daily wrap-up at 7 p.m. And all those times are Central Standard Time. So just uh, be aware of that. If you're not able to join us for the live presentations when they happen, you can always go back and watch them later through the archived videos on our social media sites like on Facebook or on the YouTube channels uh, for UA Museums. It's just, just youtube.com slash UA Museums or you can check out the Tuscaloosa Public Library's YouTube channel as well. Uh, we also have a handy dandy uh, resource guide at bamabuckfest.org. You can find a link to that. It's got additional links to uh, everything we've been talking about here today about uh, stinging and biting things as well as black widows. Uh, so you can go check that out. And for a full schedule of events and a list of places to access the Bama Bug Fest content, you can go to bamabugfest.org and uh, get that as well. And as always, I uh, just want to thank our collaborating partners for making this event happen. And thank you to you, Dr. John Friel, for helping us out today and uh, guiding us uh, through some of those uh, uh, those different uh, characters that we might find in our backyards. And like any questions that come in, I'll be part of the 7 p.m. wrap up and question answer. So again, if you've got questions, uh, you can either uh, submit them, check back in and ask them at that time. And uh, yeah, so we appreciate you sharing a little, a little bit of your time and expertise uh, expertise with us uh, today at this 4 p.m. hour, but we'll, we'll see you again at 7 p.m. Uh, so uh, that's going to do it for us. Uh, so see you next time on Bama Bug Fest on the web. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. See you, Rebecca.